Well, good morning. A special welcome to anyone who might be joining us here for the first time. We are grateful to have you here with us. We're studying through the book of Romans as a church, and we're going to pull out of that this morning. And if you would turn to Acts chapter 13 is where we're going to be studying. This is Paul's first recorded sermon in the Bible, and it's just so rich. I'd love to spend a couple months on it, but I want to just focus this morning on a very specific part of this sermon, and I'm going to use self-control with all the thoughts that have been flowing through my head this week. So the focus I want to narrow in is Paul's treatment of the resurrection in this sermon, and I believe it will teach us much and, and bring great blessing to our hearts this morning. And like any good sermon, Paul's going to bring it to a decision. He, 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 just as Ken just preached and said that it's coming to a decision. What do I do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? He, he, he's not going to let us ignore it. He won't just let it be a symbol or a concept. He demands a response that we can't stay neutral on this one. And so I want to give you your outline this morning as we look through this passage. Paul's going to give us four considerations in regards to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First, we're going to see that this resurrection was planned. Second, that it's a fact, a historical fact. Third, it was the fulfillment of the whole Old Testament. And fifthly, then it must be, or fourthly, it must be responded to. So let's go to our Lord and pray and ask that he would bless his word to us this morning. Father, I come before you and I pray now that you will put Jesus Christ on display. Lord, that his glory would fill this place. Our minds would understand the truth of this word and we would see glory. We would see Christ and we would understand what you have done in history and why. And that this would be the meeting place of our souls with the living God. Father, I pray, have your way with us this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to start with kind of a, a big picture and then we'll narrow down. And it's really every heart needs to start with when you think about your life, why you exist, what's your purpose. This needs to be answered. And I heard about a, a scientist named Charles Meisner, and he was a specialist in the general relativity theory that Albert Einstein uh, understood and came up with. And he did a lot of research on Einstein and trying to understand uh, him as a, as a human. And Charles Meisner, uh, he, he was one of the most brilliant minds of his time. And he was a man who was taken up, uh, Einstein was a man who was taken up with the idea of a creator. He said he was overwhelmed by the author of this world and yet he wasn't a religious man. He didn't partake in organized religion. Charles gave some amazing insight into Einstein that, that kind of has taken up my thoughts all week and I wanted to begin with this morning. I want to share it with you by way of introduction, and I think it's safe that no preacher on the face of the earth will begin with this quote. <clears throat> I'm weird. Thank you. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Listen to this quote. He said, I do see the design of the universe as essentially a religious question. It's one that should have some kind of respect and awe for this whole business. It's very magnificent and shouldn't be taken for granted. In fact, he says, I believe that is why Einstein had so little use for organized religion. Although he strikes me as basically a very religious man, he must have looked at what the preachers said about God and felt that they were blaspheming based on what he was seeing in this universe. He had seen more majesty than they had ever imagined, and they just weren't talking about the real thing. My guess is that he simply felt that the religions he had run across did not have a proper respect for the author of the universe. And he's saying that what, what Einstein saw in this creation was so majestic and the author of it brought such reverence and awe that he just couldn't bear religion talking about stress, how long your dress is, and all these different things. He's saying you're missing God. And the most significant thing in the world is God. And we're starved for the greatness of God. And this morning I want to come 
and look, what have we done with a book about God? It's a book that is theocentric. It's God-centered, and we've made it anthropocentric. We've made it man-centered. And then we turn church into a business with cogs for what human beings want. And we made it about us and what makes us happy on our way to heaven. And heaven will be all about us. It's a great error. It's a great sin with such a God. And what I want to do this morning is bring you into what Einstein saw. And I want to take it beyond what Einstein saw. Because this creator that drew his awe created all of this with a plan, a plan that would take Einstein's breath away if he knew it. A plan with more glory and majesty than creation itself. Creation exists to serve the purpose that I'm going to proclaim to you this morning. God is the main purpose of this universe, and he has a plan. A plan that is awesome, and it demands all of my worship and praise and life. And so if you'll come with me, to Acts chapter 13. I want to start with just highlighting the plan of God in this sermon. And I just want to begin with how God-centered it is. This is how we're to look at history. And so just start with me in verse 17. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he, God, led them out from it Verse 18, he put up with them in the wilderness for 40 years. Verse 19, when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, God, he distributed their land as an inheritance to all which took about 450 years. After these things, he, God, gave them judges and Samuel, a prophet. Then they said, give us a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man from the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. Verse 22, after he removed him, God raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Verse 23, from the descendants of this man, according to the promise, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. John proclaimed him before his coming, a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And while John was completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose that I am? I'm I'm not he, I'm just a prophet. But behold, one is coming after me whose sandals are feet. I'm not worthy to even untie. Brethren, sons of Abraham, family, and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent into the world. And just keep watching as we journey this passage This is what God has done with this earth that he has created, and he's bringing about a plan of salvation. And I want you to hear this, that the creator of this universe is awesome, and he has a plan that he is working out. That's why all of history exists. He was overwhelmed with creation. I'm overwhelmed with history because it's his story and why and what he's doing in this world. And he said it's to bring a salvation to all the peoples, to give them unmeasured, unparalleled, unending pleasures forevermore in him. I feel like Einstein when I look at the purpose in the Bible and the church is taken up with lesser things. I wouldn't go to church either if it's not taken up with the splendor and majesty of a God who is working out a plan of salvation from every angle. I wouldn't even go to church if all it was was moral rules and lists and stuff like that. I wouldn't even go. But this, I would never miss. Let's take it up. First point, this gospel was planned. This gospel was promised. Read, uh, let me look at verse 23. From the descendants of this man, David, according to this promise... God brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the climax of history. He sent his Son into the world. And I want to start with the promise that has been worked out for thousands of years by the hand of God, and we call it our Old Testament. And I'm going to hit on some highlights for you this morning of of the unfolding of this promise. The gospel does not begin when Jesus is born. And you'll never see its glory and fullness if you don't understand all that God did in dropping that jewel into this world. It begins in Genesis, not Matthew. 
And it begins, God calls out Abraham. And God says to Abraham, through you and your seed, I'm going to bless all the nations. The whole world will be blessed with this gospel. It's a resurrection promise that was given to Abraham. (coughs) Three generations later, to the tribe of Judah, he says the seed of Abraham, who, who was born of Jacob. He says in Genesis 49, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs, Jesus, and to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples. He'll be praised and he'll be worshiped. So now we see that this blessing that came to Abraham is going to come through a person and all the nations are going to give obedience to this person. A hundred years later, God sent to Israel a king named David who was born in the house of Judah. And a promise was made to David through the prophet Nathan. He says, I will raise up your offspring after you, David, who will come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And so one's going to come from your line, David, and his kingdom is going to reign forever. And so a blessing is coming then to all the nations through the house of Judah, and it's going to be a king whose kingdom, his reign will last forever. And then he colors it out a little more in Isaiah. And Isaiah says, 700 years before Jesus, a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders and his name. What's his name? It's going to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, the Prince of Peace. And there'll be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then and forevermore. So this child will be born and he will reign forever on the throne of David and he will be mighty God. The one who comes in the world from this seed will be God. And then Micah later gets even more specific. And Micah the prophet says, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, and his origin is from old and is of the ancient of days. And so this one who's going to be born has existed for all of eternity. The ancient of days will enter into this world. And again, this was 700 years before Jesus was born with all these documents. We got more historical proof of these documents than anything that's ever been written. And so the question is, how would a king reigning on David's throne bring blessing to all the nations? That's the promise to Abraham. That's that's what we're looking at. And I want to answer for you in Isaiah 53 what God said in the Old Testament he would bring. He said, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him. There was no halo, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. This one was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore And our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourgings were healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We've wandered from God. Each of us has turned to his own way but the Lord has caused the iniquity, iniquity, iniquity of us all to fall on him. So the blessing would come from this ruler dying on a cross. And he'll die not for his own sins, but for the sins of many. Sins were going to be taken off of us and put on Jesus Christ. And by his stripes, we will be healed. 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the question, what good is a dead man? Well, Isaiah 53, right after the prophecy of the cross, now prophesies the resurrection. He said, the Lord was pleased to crush him. The father was pleased to crush his son, putting him to grief if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring, us. He'll see his offspring. He'll prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul on the cross, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant Jesus, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered among the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. And so he's not dead. He has risen just as he said. So I want you to see this morning that this whole Old Testament story is fulfilled in the New Testament. It's fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. There would be a blessing that would come to all the nations through Abraham, through the house of Judah, on the throne of David. A child would be born whose name is Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God. He'll be born into Bethlehem, and he'll be born to die for the sins of his people on a cross by being pierced through for our transgressions and he'll die and he'll be buried and he'll be raised on the third day to reign forever on the throne of David and his kingdom will have no end and we will live forever with him. 700 years before he was born. Stop unbelief. I think Einstein was right. I want your breath to be taken away with stuff like that. And see, as one preacher said, Jesus is not just a rabbit pulled out of a historical hat, but thousands of years he was pictured and promised to come and do what he did so we would just worship and be uh, followers of him the rest of our days. God has been working a long time to make Jesus understood and known and received for who he is and what he came to do in this world. And so this morning, I just want you to join with me. This was planned, and it was planned by God, and it was planned for thousands of years and promised. And now I want to come to the second point. It was a fact. Come with me to verse 26. (coughs) Brethren, sons of Abraham's family, so Paul is now going to preach in the synagogue. And he says, those among you who fear God, I want you to hear this to us. The message of this salvation has been sent out. And this morning to all of us, this message of salvation is being sent out. And now our transition from history, here's the message. Come with me to verse 27. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. And so every Sabbath, they they would gather in the synagogue and read the Old Testament. And they're reading it, and they can't see everything we just went over, and they, they killed him. They fulfilled the prophecies, and they don't even get what they're doing. And so he's saying that they missed it. And though they found No ground for putting him to death. They couldn't find anything. There's no claim that could stick. He was innocent. He was holy and perfect. They asked Pilate, execute him. Verse 29, when they had carried out all that was written concerning him. These instruments just carrying out the plan of God. And when they were done, they took him down from a cross, dead, and laid him in a tomb. And verse 30, God raised him from the dead. Jesus Christ has been raised. And for many days then, he, Jesus, appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. The very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. These ones who are hiding away in a room and afraid, who are now out boldly preaching Jesus Christ. We saw with our own eyes, we touched, we put our fingers in his holes in his hands. We've seen the resurrected Christ. 
All they had to do was produce a body and the lie was over. And just these witnesses are testifying, he's alive. And so it is certain. And we preach to you then the good news of the promise that was made to these fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children and that he raised up Jesus. And so I want you to see that the resurrection is a fact. I have people who will say to me, you know what? I don't like this about Christianity. I don't like that about Christianity. I don't like their views on marriage. I, this whole resurrection thing just seems bizarre. I think it's just a symbol. I don't like organized religion called the church. There's just a bunch of things that I don't like about Christianity. So I reject it. I just reject it. And I just want you to hear this. There is no intellectual integrity to just writing it off because of what you like and don't like. Every religion in this world is you pick the ones that fit you. And this isn't how it works. The one preaching this sermon, he had every reason to reject Christianity. Paul hated it. He hated this message more than anybody in the world. He was a monotheist. And now they're saying there's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God and equal. He hated it. He hated that they said there's no more temple where you offer sacrifices. It's done. It's fulfilled. We don't need the temple any longer. And and what really got him is no more law. The law has been fulfilled. He loved Moses. He memorized the whole Pentateuch. He hated anyone saying that we're not under the law of Moses. And he was killing anyone who professed that Jesus is Lord. He's going around killing anybody. Is there anybody who could reject Christianity more than the Apostle Paul? Then it happened. (laughs) Jesus appeared to Paul on the way to Damascus where he was going to put to death the Christians. And he's knocked off his horse by the bright light of the glory of Jesus Christ. And he says, who are thou, Lord? And that's a turning point of all of Paul's life when he saw that Jesus is Lord and he's resurrected and he's the King of Kings. It didn't matter how he felt about Christianity. He's now face to face with the risen Christ. How you feel about Christianity no longer mattered. Lord Jesus was before him, and he's raised Lord of all. And I want you to hear this, that those in Paul's day had problems with Christianity as well. They had no place for a resurrection in Paul's day. Uh, Secular historians tell us that the worldview of first century Christians would would be rejected in so far off as even a notion. So they didn't like Christianity either. No place for it. Our worldview today has no place for it. We're scientific. We don't have stuff like this. So what could break through such unbelief and having no place for such a gospel? Paul was skeptical. The apostles were skeptical. The first century Jews are skeptical. And today I find so much Christianity offensive. I'm skeptical. I have no place for it. The problem is we can say we don't like what Christianity teaches. We want a religion that believes and does this or that. We choose because it fits us. But this did not fit anything that was just mentioned. And so the question is, was Jesus Christ raised from the dead by God the Father and saying there is salvation in him and in no other name. They go into any grave and look, and they're decaying, and in this one it's empty. And what needs to be dealt with is that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, and it doesn't matter what you like or don't like, you've got to deal with this God and his plan and what he has done. Paul was more offended by Christianity than anyone It didn't make sense. He didn't like it. But when he looked at Jesus Christ raised from the dead, nothing else mattered now. And he gave his life to follow that Christ till they cut his head off. Christianity teaches that the resurrection was a fact. With everyone living at the time, they had no place for a resurrection from the dead. And Christianity spread through the Roman Greco area like wildfire. And within two to three centuries... Christianity had completely supplanted all religions in the Western world at that time. And I want to show you this morning why. So this resurrection was planned. It was a fact. And third, the resurrection was a fulfillment. It's not just a fact. 
It was fulfilled in verse 26. Uh, Those among you who fear God, to us, this message of salvation has been sent. Verse 32, if you'll come look with me. And Paul says, verse 32, we preach to you the good news of the promise that was made to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That God has fulfilled this promise that we began this sermon with to our children and that he raised up Jesus from the dead. As it is also written in the second psalm, this is Psalm 2, verse 7. God says, you are my son today, I have begotten you. He was the son of God. In verse 34, as for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David from Isaiah 55, 3 with this everlasting covenant. I will give you those blessings. And then verse 35, therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one, Jesus, to undergo decay. Speaking of the resurrection. And David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers, and he underwent decay. David's decaying, decayed in a grave. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. This was the fulfillment of all of God's promise. Jesus Christ would come into the world, and he would bear the wrath of God for our sins, the just one for the unjust, and that he would come and he would live the life that we should have. God demands a perfect obedience, and Jesus came and fulfilled the law's demands, and he paid its curses for all of our breakings against God's righteousness. And so I just want you to see that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the whole Bible. It's all been pointing and picturing and showing him, and when he raised him up from the dead, It declares it is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The resurrection is the fulfillment. God spoke to us in many ways through prophets and in portions in different ways. And in these last days, he's spoken to us in his son. He spoke the final word, and it was Jesus. And he was the last word that all of history has been moving and pointing to. It's all about Jesus. In him, there is no other name for salvation. Him alone He's the narrow way. We enter through him alone. This is God's plan of salvation. And I want to close out with why I picked this passage. As the resurrection was planned by God, it was a certain fact. And all the witnesses appeared to 500 people at once, and Peter and all of them, and they declared they saw him. And then the resurrection is a fulfillment of the whole Bible. The whole Old Testament, he came and fulfilled everything that it said he would be. And now to close out, it must be responded to. The question is, so what? What does this have to do with me 2,000 years later? What, how does that affect me? I'm just here. I just want to spend a holiday with my family and eat honey-baked ham afterwards and cheesy potatoes and rolls and you know what I'm getting at. I just came for that. I just want pictures. I want to put on my Easter dress. Come on. You got anything better for me than that? I do. (laughs) I do. I got something that's going to take your breath away. What you've been looking for your whole life, I'm going to now answer. And I want to bless you today and for all of eternity. Come with me to verse 38. Pastor's favorite word is therefore. In light of this promised gospel and light that Jesus came and fulfilled it and died on a cross and was buried and was raised. He's not decaying. In light of that, seated at the right hand of God this morning in victory, therefore let it be known to you, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, the forgiveness of your sins is proclaimed. It's being offered to you this morning, really from God. I'm an ambassador from Jesus Christ, begging that you get your sins forgiven and be reconciled to God. An angel appeared appeared to Mary with a baby and said, you're going to have a baby and you're going to name him Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. 
The universal reality is every human has felt this need. Everybody's felt it. I have sin. I need forgiveness. I'm aware of sin. Most of us just spend our whole lives trying to say, woo, I can't hear you. And we just try to get busy and preoccupied. And I don't want to think about sin. And I certainly don't want to this morning, pastor. Shut up. I'm just saying, suppress it. And we all know it's there. And I try my best to be the best person I can possibly be. I try to be valuable to society. I treat people the way I want to be treated. But when my head hits that pillow, I know it. I know it. I'm guilty. My inner lawyer that God gave you is a conscience. And it was given to us by him. And it tells us we're guilty. No matter how much we work and try to be good, I just can't get to this place where I know I'm not guilty. No matter what lies we tell ourselves, I, I am a good person, I am a good person, and, and then one person tells me I'm not, and I'm undone. No matter what lies you tell yourself, you, you've hired a psychiatrist to keep telling you you're okay, and it's not getting rid of the guilt. We know we're guilty. Deep down, I know it's not enough. One person says you're bad, a parent tells you that, and it ruins your life. Something is always nagging at me, and I know it, and I feel it, and you're messing with it. But one day there's going to be a doctor who might look you in the face and say, you have terminal cancer. Get your house in order. And I'm telling you, as a pastor, it's going to hit you. What you spent your whole life trying to suppress is now going to come like a lightning bolt. And all the lies work no longer. And you're on your deathbed. I had this one man, and he called me in, and he said, Pastor, uh, I don't know if I've done enough. And I just said, I can answer that easily. No, you haven't. But he's facing death, and all of a sudden, all that guilt is rising up. Have I done enough to, to overcome all this bad things that I've done? We had a dear gentleman saved in prison and he just became a godly man in our church. And when he was dying, he called me in alone. He said, Pastor, I did some really bad things. Am I going to be safe? And I whispered the gospel in his ear and he just lifted. But I can just tell you, when you get to that deathbed, all the lies don't work any longer. They will not help you. You're going to need this gospel this morning that I'm proclaiming to you to give you safe passageway to eternal glory with God. Your lies to your own heart won't stand up on the last day. And on a judgment day, you're going to stand before the one, this Jesus, and it says he knows your heart better than you do, and he knows all things. All the lies are gone. You stand before him now naked and opened up before the one who says, I know all things. This nagging guilt because the sins that I have done in the past and all my best efforts aren't helping. The Bible says in verse 38 and 39, through him, through him, Jesus. We've seen that Jesus didn't die for his own sins. He was perfect. Whose sins did he die for on the cross? Amen. Mine and yours for the forgiveness of sins that they could be blotted out and removed from your account that you could, though you were scarlet, your sins could be made as white as snow. God says, I'll throw your sins behind my back. I'll bury them in the deepest sea. I'll remember them no more. There's a way with all this sin that can be forgiven. It can be done because Jesus Christ was not forgiven on the cross. He bore what your sins deserved so you could be forgiven. There's a way to have your sins washed away this morning. I offer to you this morning that through Jesus Christ, you can walk out of here with the words forgiven over your heart and your conscience, your mind. There is the offer of forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. And in verse 39 doesn't just end with forgiveness of sins. 
that through him, Jesus, everyone who believes in him, it's by faith. Everyone who believes in this Jesus and what he has done, what I'm declaring this morning is what? Freed from all things. Freedom. From what? From which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. You're, you can find freedom this morning. And this word here, it's the word for justified. To be uh, acquitted. It's a, it's a law term. Declared innocent. Condemnation taken away for all your sins before God. To go from a dungeon to green meadows, innocent, not guilty before God. You, this morning you can be declared not guilty. We live in all our guilt and this gospel brings you into this place where God himself says not guilty. That's better than a psychiatrist. I need God to tell me not guilty, not my mom, not my best friend. I need God. You are not guilty before me. And the law of Moses, that law cannot justify you. It can't make you right with God. It cannot bring freedom. Your moral agenda, whatever you're trying, will never set you free. Cleaning up and living a better life, hear this, does not bring freedom. And you know it as you sit here this morning. It's not getting rid of the guilt. I tried for years and years and I could not get that guilt off. No rubbing up against the law could ever cleanse me. I just kept trying to keep it and rubbing up against it and all that was happening is I was getting worse. It could not bring freedom. It brought to me bondage, trying to live under a law to obey it, to get God to love me and accept me and forgive me. It killed me. And the law of Moses is the best law that has ever been given. It was given by God. It revealed his righteousness. There's never been a better or more holy standard that's ever been given to humanity. And in the law of Moses, you can never get free. The moral instruction cannot set you free. A good law is not going to help you this morning. If you go to Moses to, to lift guilt and sin, it will just get heavier. Keep trying to clean up and be a good person, come to church. It, it will not clear it. It was the best religion that there ever was. But it could do nothing for my sin except shine light on it. All it did was show me I'm a sinner. I'm trying to climb it up to get to heaven, and it just keeps showing me you're bad. <laughs> you're broken. You're evil. You, you love yourself more than God. It just kept shining, shining. So it can command the law can command, but the problem was with me. The law wasn't the problem. It was who it was commanding. My heart, my guilt, my sin, my separation from God. It couldn't do it. It just made me feel more guilty and broken. And maybe religion's done that to you your whole life. It just makes you feel guilty and, and broken. And it doesn't bring healing and joy. You've missed it. It did zero. Paul said it actually created loss. It led me away from God instead of to him. So hear this, sin is not budged by religion. Moral instruction will never set you free from sin. And our world is filled with that lie. It's not true. I hear it all the time. I tried Christianity and it didn't work. For that very reason, you tried it as a rule book and for better living. And not the glory of a resurrected Christ who came into this world to take away sin and let you stand before God justified. So freedom from the law of Moses is what's being declared, that you don't have to keep its demands because Jesus came into this world and he did. But as you stand in Christ who did keep its demands, you this morning could be treated as if you lived that life if you will believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You could be declared by God not guilty. Isn't that what you've been looking for your whole life? When, when I was growing up, all my religion did was bring guilt. And when I finally heard God say, not guilty, it was the best news that I have ever heard in my whole life. Not guilty before God? A creep like me? Not guilty. You can be free from God's wrath and condemnation for all of your sin this morning. And you could be loved and love others now for the rest of your days. That is the good news of the gospel. 
The gospel is that I don't have to get rid of my sin and my guilt by religion and morality. This is the gospel for bad people. It's the gospel for sinners among who I am foremost. It's not for the morally clean and squeaky ones. It's not it. Christ said, I came for the sick, not the healthy. I came for the sick, right? Yeah, not, not the healthy. I came for sinners, not for the righteous. This is what this gospel is for. It's for sinners who come to Jesus to wash away every sin that you've ever done or had. The resurrection tells me I can be saved through Jesus Christ. God lifts them up and says, salvation in Jesus Christ for all your sins and that you can be justified. I was trying to think through some illustrations. I heard one this week. Picture you're in a department store and you buy something and you put it in a bag and they give you a receipt and you're walking out and as you're walking out, someone stops you from the store and says, hey, let me see what's in that bag. And then he says, have you paid for this? And your heart rate maybe goes up and you pull out the receipt and you say, oh, security officer or mall cop. It's a big debate in, it's a big debate in the industry. <laughs> oh, mall cop, trouble me not. I have a receipt. I'm free. And we've all done things in our lives and there are some things that are hard to forget and we don't feel good about ourselves. And we just think, God, will he truly accept me on the last day? And it just haunts you. And I want you to hear this. The resurrection is the greatest receipt in the history of the world. And it stamps across history in a way so everybody can read. God's declaring to the world that through Jesus Christ and faith in him alone, your sins have been paid for. You're free. No condemnation. Here's my receipt. Paid in full by Jesus Christ. There's no double jeopardy in the kingdom of God. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. They're already paid for. Why, would he, why do you got to pay for them again? Jesus bled and died for them. Done. Here's my receipt. Washed in the blood of the lamb. I was thinking if you went to jail for a crime, say you committed a crime, 10 years. And at the end of 10 years, the prison doors open up and you walk out. You're not going to keep looking over your shoulder. It's been paid for. Penalties paid. You're free to walk out now. Our penalty was death. The soul that sins must die. And Jesus went right into death and he paid it. He paid it in full till he bowed his head and died on that cross. And then he went into the grave and he defeated death. And he was raised on the third day. And God the Father said to the world, it has been paid in full. God the Father has testified this was a salvation. There is salvation in Jesus Christ. Paid in full. Our resurrection to eternal life is absolutely certain because Jesus has been raised in victory and the Father has said salvation in him by faith and not by your works. Best news in the world. And so as it has always been, Jesus Christ is the dividing line in humanity. On the cross, there was a thief cursing him, and one finally sees it and says, oh, stop. We deserve this. He's innocent. Remember me today. And Jesus says, today you'll, you'll be with me in paradise. What do you do with the Son of God who was sent into this world? This whole creation of this world was for this plan. And God says that all revolves around now what you do with Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with his plan and his resurrected Savior who is now Lord of Lord and King of Kings. This is truly the most important decision you will ever make. Whatever decisions are sitting on your chest this morning, they're small compared to this. This is the eternal decision, the eternal question that everyone must answer. What will you do with this Jesus? And in our passage, there are two responses. One is to believe that God sent his son into the world and he died on that cross for my sins and he was raised for my justification so that I can stand before God not guilty. And I believe and I surrender and I entrust my soul to that Christ. I worship him. He's my God. That's the response that God calls for. It's the obedience of faith to respond to that gospel. 
And now if you'll look with me in verse 40 to the other response, there's another response, and I want you to hear it. In verse 40, he says, therefore, which I love, take heed. Do you know what that means? You better pay attention right now. You better listen. Take heed. So that the thing spoken of in the prophets, this is going to be a quote from Habakkuk, will not come upon you, present day hearers. You better take heed and listen this morning so that this doesn't come upon you. And he says, behold, you scoffers and marvel and perish for I'm accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. If they sit and exposit it and tell you the truth of the gospel and explain what God has done in Jesus Christ, you won't believe. You will not believe. You scoff. You walk around and you, you're proud of your little arguments of why you're rejecting Jesus Christ. You know what that's called? A scoffer. And he's saying the one thing you can't do with Jesus Christ is scoff and reject and not believe in the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. Have you spent your life scoffing, kind of smug, ridiculing Christianity? Maybe just trying to keep the law of Moses? You won't believe even if someone describes it to you. Take heed because the curse that fell on Jesus Christ on that cross for sin will be the curse that will fall upon you for all of eternity. That's why I'm fervent this morning. I don't want anyone to live and die under that eternity. Please, don't scoff. Receive. Believe. You'll, you'll, you'll never forget this day in history when you were told this. Did you scoff? Or did you believe? When, when one like the Son of God was born into this world and went under a curse on our behalf so that you could be forgiven of every sin and justified before God. You've got to deal with this. Whether you like Christianity or not, He is risen. And that's what you've got to deal with this morning versus all your arguments, there's a risen Christ and it's got to be dealt with. And as we close for the believers this morning, this is our hope. It's called the grace of God. And I want you to see clearly an awesome God who controls all of history to work out this story of salvation. It's taken my breath away all week just thinking about what Einstein struggled with this gospel's amazing. And he is offering him to any who will receive him this morning. To put down your resistance and your fight and your unbelief and receive the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. So I want you all to stand up, unless you can't. If your legs fell asleep while this long-winded pastor was preaching, you may sit down. But I want you to stand with me and declare our unified faith and our hope this morning in the Lord Jesus Christ. And by declaring this, it is your faith that your sins are forgiven. And I want you to hear this. You stand this morning completely and fully justified in the sight of God, loved and accepted and children of God who will be safely brought to glory because of Jesus Christ alone. I want you to look at that with the eyes of faith this morning and answer this question and don't say it just for ritual. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You can sit down. That's our blessed hope. I'm going to be up front afterwards if you'd like to talk with me more about Jesus Christ and how to know that you have been saved from the coming judgment and wrath of God and saved up into the most beautiful salvation that there, there could be. And so I'll be up front and I want you to leave this morning forgiven and free and justified. So let's pray. 
Father, I thank you for this gospel. Lord, I, th I thank you for why Einstein struggled with the beauty of this creation and the church playing games with a God that majestic. And I pray that our hearts have been lifted even more that that creator created a salvation like this and even gave his own son to pierce through for our transgressions so he could be just. He could be just in punishing his own son so he could be merciful and forgiving every sin that we have. Oh God, thank you for this gospel. Let every heart, let no one walk out of here being a scoffer. Let, let it end this morning and let them call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in him and be saved. God, work in every heart this morning, I pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, all God's people said,